join me in prayer following along in the prayer of confession in your bulletin. I'll lead us in our prayer of faith and then we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault in thought and word and deed and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Father God, in Christ, you have answered that prayer. Our sins are no more. You do not remember them. They no longer hang over our heads. They've been paid. They've been paid in full. We praise you, Father, because there is no God like you. A God who is mighty to save, so full of grace and mercy, so just and righteous, so holy and loving. Lord, you have opened our minds to your truth and warmed our hearts to the beauty of your glory. We're driven to sing, to pray, to meditate on your word, to love and worship you. It's in your love that our happiness is found. It's in your sovereign, fatherly love for us that we find true and lasting rest. For trouble may swirl about us, the enemy may try and attack us. But though the storms may rage and crash around us, they will never harm us. For under your wing, no harm can come. Lord, we pray for your spirit to renew and revive us. Not just us, but all the churches throughout the world that bear your name, that you claim as your own. Work in us so that your love and glory are so palpable to us, is so clear to us, that we cannot help but unite together in your love and bear testimony to it throughout the world through our life and words and deeds. Lord, we pray all this in the name of Jesus, our brother, our savior, our redeemer, our friend, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
text this morning is from Isaiah, Isaiah, the end of chapter 44, beginning of verse 24, reading through 45 and verse 7, and in a bit we'll come to that text itself. It was 404 years ago, it was 1609, and a man was being marched at gunpoint about 100 miles north of here as the crow flies, up around Penobscot Bay. And he was being marched at gunpoint to an English ship. He was being marched away from his family, his village, from everything he had known and loved. He was being brought to England, and he was being brought to England to be put on display. The English had arrived earlier that year. They had anchored offshore. They had met with the natives. They had, in fact, spent the summer having what we might call clam bakes on the edge of the ocean with the natives in the area. But when they decided it was time to go back home, they wanted to show the king and the queen uh, what the natives were like. And so they captured six or seven of them. And this particular one who was marching at that time toward the ship must have had a million thoughts floating through his mind. He had probably never walked more than 20 miles from his home ever in his lifetime. And now he was going to embark on the great sea and they had no idea, he had no idea where that sea led or how large it was. And I imagine, as I say, his mind must have been swirling with thoughts. But there's one thought that I will bet was not in his mind. I'll bet it did not cross his mind that this might be good. That it might be in God's plan. That the providential hand of a good God might be on him. If I were a betting man, I would bet that that thought never crossed his mind. Well, he arrived in England, and he was the only one of all that were stolen who lived. Because those on these shores who had grown up here were not immune to the kind of diseases that they encountered overseas, back in England. But he did live. And it was decided at some point that he should be educated. And so it was that he was sent to Oxford and he received the best education in the land. In about 1619, he got restless and wanted to be back home. He wanted to be back here. He wanted to be back in his village with his family, with that which was familiar. And he made his way back across the Atlantic on a merchant ship that took him down in the Caribbean. And he began to make his way north and he traversed the land on foot all the way up until in November of 1620, 11 years after he had been taken from his homeland, in November of 1620, he ended up here at Plymouth. And when the English crossed the Channel, crossed the Atlantic again, and anchored off Plymouth in Plymouth Harbor, he stepped out of the woods and said, welcome, Englishman, and he was the best educated of all of them. Now the plans for that moment when he stepped out of the woods and welcomed those who had left their homeland also in 1609. In 1609, the, the pressure, the persecution was so severe on the church in England that a small church north of London left their home and crossed the English Channel to find refuge in Holland because the Dutch offered freedom of religion and they went in 1609 and settled, resettled in Amsterdam. But they were only there about a year and they began to come into conflict with other English churches that had also escaped the persecution in their homeland. And so this particular church moved again. They moved north to the, to the university city of Leiden. 
and they settled there, and their leader, John Robinson, became a professor at Leiden University, which provided something of an anchor for them to stay there in Leiden, which they did. Which they did until about 1619, but then they ran into a problem they had not anticipated. Their children, who had come across with them as little tykes, were now teenagers and going into adulthood, and they were becoming Dutch because of Dutch culture and their exposure. And this the English did not want to happen. They wanted to preserve their English heritage. And so they decided to move again. And this time they boarded a revamped wine ship that was in England named the Mayflower, and you know the rest of the story. And so in 1620, this Indian from Penobscot Bay was there to meet the pilgrims when they landed at the same point of land and able to say to them, welcome, Englishmen. Now, that sounds to me something like the providential hand of God. It sounds like it can't be just an accident. And when we turn to the scriptures, we're told that's what we ought to be expecting all the time. We ought to be always expecting that there is a hand on us that we are being guided. The things that seem awful in the moment, the see, things that seem ungodly in the moment, the things that seem impossible in the moment, they are still under the providential hand of God. And whereas Squanto had no reason in his faith to ever think such a wild thing that God could be, be behind the evil he was experiencing, those who know Jesus Christ are really commanded to do so. We are under orders to give thanks for everything. And we are under orders to give thanks in all circumstances. And when we think through our life and the life we live in the world in the newscasts every night, we don't see on the surface why we should be thankful for most of it. But we are. We are commanded to give God thanks for everything. Ephesians chapter 5 down in verse 18. We are to give God thanks in all circumstances. 1 Thessalonians 5, again, verse 18. In those two passages, we are brought up short. We are brought up short in the sense that we have to rethink life, our life, the life we're living on earth. We have to rethink reality. There's something going on that we can't see when we look at the surface of life. It's something we can't understand when we simply watch events go by. It's something we can't appreciate when history is taught to us. And that's because we're Christians and because the Bible tells us a different story than the world is trying to get us to believe. Now, the text that we have for the morning tells this in a marvelous way because it's Isaiah writing 200 years before King Cyrus was born. King Cyrus was the Persian emperor who attacked Babylon and he conquered the city and established the Persian Empire in place of the ancient Babylonian Empire. Daniel had predicted this. It was already known that this would happen. Daniel had told King Nebuchadnezzar, the great Babylonian king, that the dream he saw one night of a great statue on the plains of Dora, which was startling, a head of gold, it had silver shoulders, a belly of bronze, legs of iron, and the feet of iron and clay mixed, it baffled the king. He did not know what to make of it. He knew it was from the gods, and therefore it did frighten him. He knew it had something to do with him, but what he needed to know. And he was so insistent, so scared, in a sense, of what it might mean that he was willing to kill all his soothsayers, his wise men, his diviners, if they could not tell him, not the interpretation, but the dream. Because he was not willing to accept that their interpretation would be legitimate if he first told them the dream. 
But he was sure that if they could get from the gods the nature of the dream, then he could trust their interpretation. And the soothsayers, the diviners, the wise men all backed off and said, no one's ever asked anything like that. We're not here for that. We're in this for the money. We're in this for the power, the prestige, to sit at your table. But who ever thought we were for real? But there was one in the empire who had been discovered who was for real. He was one of the Israelites who had been captured by Nebuchadnezzar when he destroyed the city of Jerusalem. When he destroyed the city and captured the Israelites, he took the best of them home and trained them up to be Babylonians. He gave them Babylonian food. He taught them Babylonian uh, letters. He gave them Babylonian names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were given names, Babylonian names, to symbolize that they were being transformed. They were being changed. And Daniel was Belteshazzar as his name was changed in order to represent what God, what, what Nebuchadnezzar wanted to make of him. And Daniel tells the king the dream. Then he interprets the dream, and then the king is satisfied. He says, oh, king, there are going to come four great empires on the earth before God sends his Messiah. The Messiah is coming, God's Savior, God's Son. Now, he doesn't say that because Daniel doesn't have all that information yet. But he knows this. He knows that in the fourth empire down the line, there will be a little stone cut out of a mountain. And that stone will begin to tumble and grow and gain size. And when the, when the stone has reached the bottom of the mountain, it will hit the feet of this statue and it will crush it. At its feet, which are only uh, clay anyway, though they are mixed with iron. And he tells how this will unfold in history. He says, King Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. And the nation following you, the kingdom following you, that will be less less." Not important, maybe, but less authoritative. After all, Nebuchadnezzar was king of kings and lord of lords on an earthly scene. But there's going to come a king, a kingdom, which has lesser authority. And then there'll be a kingdom after that with even less authority. And then there'll be a kingdom come that will rule simply by raw power, with no real authority at all, just the to strike fear into the hearts of the people so that they will not rebel, they will not dare to rebel. And that was the Roman Empire, which ruled the world with its legions and created a different kind of peace than God creates when they created the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. So this Persian Empire, this Persian Emperor, was already predicted at the time that Nebuchadnezzar was sitting on his throne. But years before this, before Nebuchadnezzar ever moved into Jerusalem, before he ever conquered Israel, before he ever deported anybody, Isaiah had lived. Isaiah lived at the end of the 8th century. This doesn't happen that I just described with Nebuchadnezzar until down in the 6th century. The king, Cyrus, the king of Persia, conquered, Jerusalem, conquered Babylon in 539 B.C., and we have to go, of course, up in numbers to go backward in time when we go B.C., but Isaiah lived between 750 and 701 B.C., 150 to 200 years before, before Cyrus, the king of Persia, conquered Belt, uh, Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. So listen to what Isaiah says with that in mind. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who foils the signs of false prophets and makes fools of diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the prediction of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited, of the towns of Judah they shall be built, and of their ruins I will restore them, who says to the watery deep, be dry, I will dry up your streams, who says of Cyrus, 
He is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him, to strip kings of his armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down the gates of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summon you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, men may know that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I am the Lord who do all these things. That was written of Cyrus 150 years before Cyrus was born. Is there a providential hand at work in our lives, ruling the world, overseeing our steps? Yes, there is. And we're told this for our peace and freedom and joy. We are told these things because when we ga gather and when we grasp what is being told us here, it will set us free. If we understand that Squanto though he was captured in 1609, was known to God before there was a heaven or before there was an earth, before there was a molecule created. God knew all his plans from the beginning. Psalm 3311 says, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. His play, plans, the plans of his heart to every and all generations. The Lord of hosts has sworn, this is Isaiah earlier on in this very book, as I have planned, so shall it be. As I have purposed, shall it stand. Later than this, Isaiah will speak again. God says, remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. From ancient times, things not yet done. Saying to me, my counsel shall stand. I will accomplish all my purpose. In Daniel, the very book we looked at earlier where Daniel records his experience, it says, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. He does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. The early apostles knew this when they preached the gospel in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. Peter stood up and said to the crowds, those who had come, this Jesus delivered up According to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you killed by the hands of lawless men. What a powerful reality to grasp that Jesus died in principle before the worlds were made in order that he might be the savior of the world that was going to be created. From the foundations of the earth, it says in Revelation, the, the sun died or sacrificed himself. How about the end of the book of Romans? Not the end, but the end of at least the argument Paul raises up or the, the discussion that he puts forward about how the gospel works. And he gets to the end and he realizes that he has said something profound and yet far beyond his capacity to grasp. He has said that God is indeed in control of all that happens, including all that we disapprove of, all that hurts, all that's evil, all that we consider wrong. Even that is from God. 
And so when Paul comes to the end, he can't say, here's how, because he doesn't know how, but he can say this. He says, oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given him a gift that he should be repaid? Well, the texts roll on. They say the same thing. They say that God is really God. And let me offer a thought to you because just as Paul cannot explain how, he does insist that it is true. Not how it is true, but that it is true. But I also think the scriptures are telling us why it is true. And let me give you this as a thought. Take it away. Pray about it. Think about it. Let it nurture you. If you were God and you knew all possibilities, you knew everything about everything and everything, you have all knowledge. That's the only thing we believe about God. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere all the time. Everything in creation happens before his faith, his face. He is omniscient. He knows all things. There's nothing he doesn't know. And one thing he does know is if he has, is going to have creatures who love him, really love him, love him for who he is, love him from the heart, love him because of himself, and not because they get something out of him, not because they're afraid of him and not, afraid not to love him, not because they have some mercenary motive, but they love him. They love him for who he, they see him. They see he is good and he is merciful and he gives of himself to the person. If they're going to love somebody like that, do you know what has to happen to every one of us? We have to be set free. We have to be set free from all fear. We have to be set free from all mercenary motives. We have to be set completely free. Do you know what keeps man in lifelong bondage? What keeps us always under and doesn't let us be free? The fear of death. Hebrews says men lived in lifelong bondage because of the fear of death. Now, if you know that, and you know death is the great enemy, it's the last enemy God will destroy. All other enemies will be under his feet before he puts death under his feet and destroys that. Paul tells us that when he writes to the Corinthians. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And if death is the great uh, fear monger in all of our lives, then what would you do if you knew that and you were God? How about if you did this? How about if you brought death and all the accoutrements of death, all that accompanies death, all the evil, all the awful things, all the suffering, all the pain, what if you yourself brought it into the world? And then you killed it. What if you brought all the evils that are possible, death itself, into the world? You brought death in. You created weal, but you also created woe. You created what is good, but you also created what is disastrous. You created it all. But you did it for this reason. Because your intention was to destroy it yourself. Now, if that is what happened in the cross of Christ, and I believe that is exactly what happened in the cross of Christ, he brought evil into the world, and he focused it on his son. The evils of men. You meant it for evil, Paul says, uh, Peter says when he preaches. Just like, just like Joseph did when he was talking to his brothers. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He means every evil thing for the good of his people. All things work together for good for those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. So if you were God and you brought evil into existence... And then you, you killed it. Do you know what can never happen again for all time to come, for all eternity? Evil can never reappear in the universe. And if evil can never reappear in the universe, you are free. You are free to love God, not because you're going to die if you don't. Not because if you're not going to be blessed if you don't. Not because of anything except who he is. He is God. 
and he is love. And his love is manifested that he sent his son into the world that we might be redeemed through him. And on that cross, he tasted death for everyone. And if God had not been God, if he had been the God of Squanto, Squanto's God, like all gods that human beings create, is dualistic. All human gods are dualistic. By that I simply mean they have a God that is light and a God that is dark, a God that is good and a God that is evil. We call him Satan. Satan is God's Satan. He is not another God. He is the instrument by which God brings evil into the world that he might destroy it in the person of his son. And all things, therefore, must work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And there is in the future now, if you are in Christ, nothing to fear. What, is, what, what can destroy you? Your future? No. Your past? Catch, no. Things beside you? Things, be, uh, things inside you? Angels? Demons? Paul goes through the whole list in Romans. He says, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because God in his wisdom brought evil into the world, manifested it, and destroyed it in the cross of Christ. If you are in Jesus Christ, you are free to love God from your heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to give thought to your word and your providential care over history and over us. And we pray that we might grasp it in such a way that it truly sets us free. Free to walk with our Savior no matter what. And even accept the things that come from his hand, uh, even if they distress us in the moment, because they are ultimately intended to bless us. Because you have indeed promised and are completing and fulfilling that promise when everything ultimately works to good for those that love you and are called according to your purpose. Let us thank you for it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Take off your guilty fears and rise.